I'm a neuroscientist. I'm interested in social aspects of our brain and the emotional circuitry that actually regulates the way we feel. Uh, we know a lot about how we experience touch. We know a lot about how we see. We know very little about what produces laughter. I can't tell you why yawning is contagious. We don't know the circuits that do this. So there's much that remains to be understood about the nervous system. And for, for a living, I basically work on how we produce emotion, what parts of the brain produce emotion. I work with rats and mice, so that's the caveat, and y'all are going to get a slightly biased approach to seeing most of my favorite things, which are those species. They are rather special. So we'll be talking about rats and mice along the way. But actually, I want to tell you as to how this talk actually came about. So Samira and, um, and Sanjana and others put together a program called Tapestry, which was a short workshop for two weeks, which involved artists and thinkers and philosophers and scientists talking to a bunch of people from diverse disciplines and she asked me to talk to them about something that might be at the crossroads of arts humanities and the sciences and um, i've been reading this book and this book was really impactful to me so it's by uh, patricia churchland and patricia churchland is a philosopher who happens to look at the philosophy of morality and takes a lot of interesting points from neuroscience. And so I was reading this book and I asked Samira, can I use this book as the starting point of a dialogue? All right. And so that idea has led to this Mumbai local. The idea is for us to have a dialogue. I give you a perspective which is from the neuroscience perspective, but there are many ways of looking at morality. You can look at it as a human being, as a citizen that's concerned about your environment, uh, you could think about it as a philosopher, a sociologist, an artist, anybody can have an opinion on this. And what I want to do is perhaps not uh, in any way be prescriptive about what neuroscience has to say, simply to say that neuroscience might also be included at that same table to have this discussion. Okay. Um, all right, so that's it and that's all I'm going to ever say about morality and we'll leave it at that, okay? The rest of it is going to be about what neuroscience might tell us about the social brain and whether understanding the social brain might by the end of this entire talk get us to starting to think about how the social brain in us, in our species, may produce constructs like morality. That's where we'll get to, okay, eventually at the end. But before I do this, I have to acknowledge the people who actually work on this and the work that I'm going to be talking about. So Patricia Churchland is the person who's put together the idea and the, the, the concept that neuroscience has something to say which might be important to our discussions on morality. Uh, but work that I'm going to talk about from people who do social neuroscience, Peggy Mason at University of Chicago, Larry Young at Emory, Tom Insel at NIMH, Sue Carter at University of Chicago, and Michael Cosfield, who is an economist but looks at neuroeconomics at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Okay? So first things, I can see that there are some kids here who are going to wonder, oh my god, how am I going to survive an hour of this, right? So let's see if we can do an experiment. Um, first, introduce yourself to the person who's sitting right next to you. Turn towards them. If you didn't come with them and you don't know them, please introduce yourself to the person next to you on either side. Say, hello, I'm blah, blah, blah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Let's make, uh, let's, let's do what we naturally do. We are social species. We are highly social species. So introduce yourselves to each other. And very good. So now that you've introduced yourselves and said, hello, I'm blah, blah, blah. The next I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to do an experiment. Okay? You're going to do an experiment with the person who's next to you. The person who's next to you, one of you is going to keep an eye on the time. You're going to time this experiment. One of you is going to be the person who performs the experiment. The other person is going to be the experimenter and count down the number of seconds. Everybody okay with me so far? You found a partner? Who's going to do the experiment and who's going to time them? You need one unit pair. One person to time, one person to do the experiment. Yeah? No? Yes? Okay? Let's, let's attempt to try to do this experiment. And you'll see why I think this experiment might have some insights that might matter to how we think about how our brain processes stuff. Okay? You're going to ignore the word that comes up on the screen. You're simply going to name the color that the word appears in. All right? And you're going to run through this and you're going to count how long it takes this person to go through this list of words. 
that's your first exercise. You just don't do it very loudly because you'll distract everybody and then everyone will have rubbish times, okay? So do it in your little unit. If you've introduced yourself to a person next to you, one of you is going to attempt to read it, the other person is going to attempt to keep time. And is that okay? Everyone okay? Everybody have a dyed pair, somebody that they introduce themselves to and that they're going to keep time on? All right, so here goes. You're simply ignoring the word, simply naming the color. Done? Yes? Everyone's done? So you have a time now, right? You have a time that it took you to read this series of colors out because you weren't reading the word. You're going to do the same task. Again, you're going to ignore the word. You're simply going to name the color and again, you're going to do the attempt of time. All right? Here goes. Ignore the word. Has anyone finished the experiment? Okay, good. So, someone back there finished the experiment. Tell me the first time and the second time. How much time did it take you on the first experiment? First one. Yeah, here as well. How much? 15 seconds and the second time was 15.2 and the second time was 46. Okay, 15.2 versus 46 seconds. What's the data from there? 15 seconds versus 31 seconds. Data from there. 18 seconds versus 12.9 seconds. I love it. You have an outlier. <laughs> That's what happens when you do an experiment. Something goes completely opposite to what you... Can you read English? Should be the question. <laughs> Because that helps, right? Sometimes if you take a child who perhaps doesn't yet know to read, this conflict will not emerge. What you just had is a situation of your brain conflicting straight within your nervous system and delaying you substantially on the second time round. That's conflict happening directly in your nervous system, right? You're getting two conflicting signals. When you have two conflicting signals, you can't handle them very, very well. Now imagine that we process impressions about people within the sort of time, time lapses that this takes as well. And within that very short time, you're processing, who is this? What are they wearing? What do they look like? Have I seen somebody who looks like this before? Is this somebody who's going to put me out of my comf comfort zone? Am I going to be challenged? Am I comfortable with this individual? Just think about the number of preconceived notions that your nervous system will deal with when you meet another conspecific. A conspecific being another member of your own species. So we're dealing with this on a constant basis. So rapid, quick responses are particularly interesting. And if I put you under stress where there's a timer and you have to try to perform really fast, then more the conflict, right? The more that I put you into a situation where you have to move quickly and reach a quick judgment call, there's the possibility of conflict. All right. So why do we think it's important to think about the social brain? Do you think that we are, um, do you think of ourselves as a species separate from the rest of our cousins in evolution? Or do you think of ourselves as one amongst many other species that evolution has, uh, has produced? And do you think of us as successful? Would you call mankind a successful experiment of man or humankind, a successful experiment of evolution? Yeah? Are we a successful experiment of evolution? 
So this is interesting. I'm going to tell you we are actually such a recent experiment, we don't have enough data. We are very recent on evolutionary time scales. We're a blip on evolutionary time scales. Insects, on the other hand, have won that debate already for you because they've been around a heck of a lot longer and have been extremely successful. Huge number of species, yeah, and have colonized all niches that are available to them. We, on the other hand, are a blip. So there's no evidence to believe that on evolutionary time scales, we will prove to be a remotely successful experiment. And currently, the way we are going, we may not even be an experiment much longer. So that's a separate story. That, of course, is a separate debate. Okay. So some of the most important experiments nature has already done for us. So as behaviorists or biologists or individuals who are exploring nature, nature has done the experiment. We simply have to look at the information that nature is sending back to us in a sense. Okay. So why should we compare? You know, we like to think of ourselves as unique, and, uh, and there's this very, very interesting argument that was put forward by Jared Diamond, where he says that we like to draw ladders, right? So we draw this beautiful ladder of evolution, and at the top of the ladder, who do we put? We put ourselves. Or we like a nice pyramid, and right at the top of the pyramid will be the human being. Or you'll start with a little reptile, and then it'll become a primate, and then it'll become a chimp, and then the chimp will straighten up, and then at the end of it will be this human being walking Usually a man walking with a briefcase. Yeah? You've seen this cartoon. You've seen this tendency to put ourselves right at the pinnacle. And that's a very wrong way to think about evolution. We are one small branch of the branch of primates, which is a branch of mammals. And mammals is only one of the branches in evolution. So in a sense, understanding evolution often tells us about our own unique experiment, mammalian evolution, primate primates more so because they're our cousins and there's much we can learn from our cousins. So why compare and is there something that we can actually gain from this? So if you look at this, so th those are ancestral vertebrates and I'm taking only vertebrates but invertebrate species are huge and if you ever wanted to study social animals, we think of ourselves as uniquely social. We have so many interesting relationships and now that you have Facebook and Twitter, you're followed by way more people than you would have ever normally had an interaction with, right? Your worlds have expanded. But the world of an ant or a bee is a far more complex social world than you and I would ever have to perhaps deal with. So remember that there are many social species other than, than us. And we are out there along that branch, mammals. And in that branch, there's much that we can learn. And of course, here's my favorite animal. So it's at the bottom, right there next to us. And you can see that there are many building blocks that are common. Nature tends to constantly use the same building blocks over and over again. It doesn't like to waste stuff. So it'll reuse this building block or co-op this building block and put it to use. So we have a nice big cerebrum. This expanded dramatically in us. In contrast, here the cerebrum is a lot smaller. If you take out this cerebrum and roll it out, you'll get a one rupee coin. If you take out our cerebrum and roll it out, you'll get a pizza. If you take out a monkey's cerebrum and roll it out, you'll get a chapati, right? So you have different scale sizes. So of course, the numbers of neurons are different. And to jump from what we see here to here would be perhaps an overstretch. But there is something we can learn, certainly by studying other species. And that just gives you a sense of the scale to which the neocortex which is this big mass that's here has expanded in human evolution. Okay, and this is the volume right there. You can see monkeys are not, do our, our cousins are right there with us. And they're highly social species with extremely important interactions and affiliations and friendships and alliances which join and break and politics. Yeah, they have politics too, like we have politics, okay? They have politics of relationships, they have dominance, they have hierarchies, they have, um, they have trauma, so they go through very similar experiences in a sense. So let's come back to this idea and let's go back to talking about a rodent species that can tell us something that might be interesting for us to think about. And now let's forget about worrying about understanding it only from our perspective. They're interesting in and off of themselves. And they would be fun to study just for their own reason. We don't have to always anthropomorphize the results. So these are two vole species. They're rodents, and they're found in, in prairies. And the montane vole and the prairie vole are very similar species in that there's a fair bit of genetic conservation. So they're really nice experiment that nature has performed. 
montane voles are asocial. They only um, come together to mate, but they do not tend to hang out together. They are minimally parental, so the, the female and the male is not involved here in the parenting. The female is involved in the parental care. There is low pair bonding, so during that period of time the female will look after the infant. So that is the first example of caring for another. Right? We all care for ourselves, that is a survival instinct. That seems to have been strongly conserved in evolution. And one can understand why, because you, if you do not have some degree of survival instinct, you are not going to be around as a successful species or experiment to even last, right. So, this species has low pair bonding and the separation distress is low, which means if you get separated from each other, it does not cause you great amount of trauma. So, if you take the pup away from the mother, the mother is not too distressed, even the pup is not terribly distressed as long as some amount of care is provided. So, after a certain age, separation distress is low. Or the prairie vole on the other hand is highly social, has a complex social architecture, they live in large families, it is biparental, so there is equal roles for the mother of course providing the lactational support, but the father does a lot of parental care, allo grooming, looks after the infants, is actively involved, the siblings continue to be actively involved in the society structure as well. It is very pair bonded in that they, if they mate, they often seem to mate for life. If one of the partners dies, more than 85 percent of the time the animal will not find another partner and the separation distress is extremely high, okay. So these animals are very, very interesting and they were, have been intensely studied by Sue Carter, Larry Young and Tom Insill and the work I am going to tell you about is their work, okay. It is work that I find very interesting and I thought this would be an opportunity to share it. So, now, let us think about the term monogamy here. Monogamy would apply in the case of the prairie vole. You please do not think about monogamy the way we necessarily think about monogamy. Just think about it as male and female cohabitation in the long term over and above breeding, okay? beyond just the breeding period. There is a long term selective association. The minute you have these very strongly pair bonded animals, you tend to have another out product with it which is the associated aggression of anything that is a threat to that pair bond. So the prairie voles show high aggression, the montane voles do not show high aggression, they do not show very high pair bonding either. So on that front they are, they are relatively neutral towards co specifics, they usually do not want to hang around with them. Biparental care as I told you and socially regulated reproduction processes such that who you are with, the animals who are in your environment can determine whether the females will ovulate or go into estrus such that the young female siblings do not have their estrus switch on until an unfamiliar male from another territory enters and then they leave the tribe and actually go and form their own little unit, okay. Mammals about 3 percent of them exhibit this kind of monogamy, okay, 5700 ish species of mammals to just give you the number. I will not give you the comparative insects, the minute you realize that you realize we are really not a very successful experiment in terms of the number of species that are out there. And in primates it is a little higher, it is about 15 percent, okay. So for example, chimpanzees do not exhibit such strong monogamous pair bonding, but they do have large social architecture, gibbons do, okay. So different animals have different kinds of behavior, all right. So let us go back to this experiment. What people watched is when they went into the wild and they simply looked at prairie voles and montane voles, they found that prairie voles most of the time spent time side by side. They would always be trapped together or they would be found together because they were huddling, okay. And you rarely found montane voles together. And so they took these animals back into a laboratory environment and then tested this and essentially you can replicate what you see in the wild. Prairie voles like to hang out with each other, montane voles are relatively asocial, they do not want to spend too much time with each other. So this was done with a test called the partner preference test, okay. So now I am going to explain how this test is done. You take a male and female prairie vole or a male and female montane vole and you, they mate. That is a 24 hour time of spending time with each other. And then a couple of days later, maybe 6 or 7 days later, you go back and you now give that animal, this animal, a chance to go back to the partner that it has mated with 7 days ago or a complete stranger, okay. And these two guys can't move around and that's indicated by this tether, otherwise everybody would be moving. So there would be no choice for this animal to choose to hang around in the neutral area with the partner or with the stranger. And look at the data there, look at the prairie vole. The prairie vole wants to spend time with the partner relatively less with the neutral or the stranger, but the montane wall just wants to hang around here. We will go and check out the other animals in general, but there is a very clear 
difference of social preference. That animal is asocial, doesn't want to really bother. Yeah? Ah, good. I was waiting for somebody to ask me this question. We are not going to extrapolate yet. If you can hold your horses, this is true for a nice montane vole and a prairie vole, but we are not voles. We have a very different nervous system. There are elements of how things are done here that might be applicable to us. Certainly the molecules that mediate some of these behaviors we also have. And the molecules that regulate these behaviors also regulate certain social behaviors in us. So I'll come to that. So wait, wait a little bit, okay? But we won't make that mistake of instantaneously anthropomorphizing. We have a tendency to do that even as scientists, we're constantly guard against it because we see something and think, aha, this is what it means. But we're looking at it through the lens of only looking at it as a human being. From the world's point of view, it might be something completely different, yeah? yeah. Okay. So, this is what I just showed you, but I also want to show you that other panel. So I said that as along with the pair bonding comes the aggression. The more pa pair bonded you are, the more uh, turf you need to protect, the more you need to push out anything that is a potential threat to that tight pair bond. So when you look at animals that have been mated, okay, so this is before mating, they were hanging out, mating and then after mating and then you say now I'm going to put in uh, aggressor in the presence, you can see prairie voles will beat up an aggressor. Okay, so in a resident intruder test of aggression, you will get a strong aggressive response to any intruder that enters the territory. Well, it's not true for the montane voles. All right, so it looks like there was a coevolution of a couple of circuits, a circuit that was responsible for pair bonding, and along with it, circuits that protected those pair bonds which were circuits that resulted in really handling threats. Okay, so there's a relative coincidence between those two. Whether they are absolutely always together or not still remains a source of some debate. But the molecules that do this are very interesting. Very ancient peptides. So if you think about hemoglobin, which everybody's heard of, it's about 500-ish amino acids, very long protein. This is about nine amino acids, so it's a very small nanopeptide okay it really is tiny and it really is it is vasotocin in reptiles and we have a vasopressin and oxytocin we initially had this for our survival it's needed to handle thirst to handle stuff like that so we absolutely essential for survival that's what vasopressin does but it also regulates one of its byproducts is it regulates pair bond formation anyone who's given birth and has had a pitocin drip put on them will know that it also induces labor it also increases lactation, okay? Women who've gone through that process have perhaps had a drip attached to them. That molecule is oxytocin, okay? And now I will walk you through this data. And if I say something that confuses you, stop me and interrupt me at any time, okay? So we're looking at females here and males. We're looking at prairie voles. We're looking at unmated females, okay? So an unmated female should not have a partner preference. Yeah, it's neutral. 50% means I don't really care. I'll go to both, right? I'm not, not, not really pair bonded yet. Without mating, as long as you pair the oxytocin injection with the odor or the presence of a male, you get pair bonded with that male, okay? So in the absence of mating, you can induce extremely strong pair bonding just by giving oxytocin with the presence of the male in whose presence the oxytocin is given. The idea is that we know that associated with the act of breeding is a release of oxytocin and that oxytocin is presumably acting in brain circuits to start building those pair bonds. The ulta of this is exactly the same. Here's a mated female who's nicely pair bonded with the animal that it has mated with. You simply don't allow oxytocin to work. You, you take a drug and you block the oxytocin receptor. And when you do that, you get rid of pair bond formation. So this is an emotional connect, not a mind connect. Oh, okay, another tough question. Emotions are and mind is eventually a consequence of brain circuits. Yeah, but, for them. but for them also, they also have a circuit that regulates emotion much the way we have a circuit that regulates emotion. We have a far more larger number of neurons that are probably regulating it. This circuit is smaller, but the circuits are built across evolution such that the building blocks are fairly similar all along the way. 
I would say they have a mind because I think your and my mind is also eventually a consequence of our brain circuits. They perhaps don't have a theory of mind the way it's classically talked about, which is to know that I have a mind, you have a mind, and I know that you can fool me. That level of secondary degree they don't have. But in terms of all the spectrum of learning, conflict resolution, aggression, emotion, mourning, loss, you see it in these species. Okay? So is that also representative of mind? It is in a sense, right? So it's, our problem is we are defining mind from a framework of only thinking about what we call the mind in the sense of what the world calls a mind. For the world's perspective, they, they don't have language. So you're not going to get the semantics the way you and I communicate, but they can produce a whole range of sounds, which is sufficient to tell the other animal what the state of the environment is. They do courtship, and when they do courtship, the males sing to the females. Ultrasonic vocalizations of a quite diverse kind. So there is courtship. There is active courtship and there's singing. So you know, you and I can't hear it, of course, but you know, you can actually record the ultrasonic vocalizations and they will actually court each other. Okay? On the other hand, for the male, it's a different molecule, but it's very similar. It's arginine vasopressin. Here's the control, not mated. You give arginine vasopressin in the presence of the female and you'll get pair bond formation. And you, if you are mated, you can get rid of that pair bond formation by blocking that particular neurotransmitter. Okay. So let's come back and summarize. So mountain or montane voles and prairie voles. So prairie voles, both of them, when they mate, release large amounts of oxytocin. So that's not different. Okay, that seems to be common across evolution. They also release a large number of endorphin. And all of you would have heard of endorphin. These are endogenous opiates. These are associated with pleasure. They're associated with reward. Okay, so they're released in both cases, except that the where the oxytocin receptor is expressed in this brain and that brain is dramatically different. And why does that matter? In the case of the prairie vole, it's in reward pathways, pathways that get reinforced to ensure that that behavior will be repeated and repeated and repeated, such that you pair the mating with that individual, the order of that is individual and that association of pleasure and that individual gets extremely strongly paired in this species. On the other hand, you still have the pleasure, you still have all of that, but the pairing doesn't happen in this particular species. Okay? So powerful effects of oxytocin on behavior, minimal effects of oxytocin on behavior on this end. Okay? All right. So if this is true and these species are so similar genetically, how does this happen? That the Oxytocin is produced in both species, oxytocin is released in both species, endorphins are released in both species, and yet the receptor is completely different in different parts of the brain here and different parts of the brain there. Turns out, this is what genetics does, right? Evolution makes experiments. Those experiments result in things. Environment may select those things or not select those things. These are just random mutations. Random mutation here versus here. There's a microsatellite in the promoter for the oxytocin and vasopressin receptor genes that ends up with a very different expression pattern in this animal versus that animal. Now, as a neuroscientist, if you believe this, you should say, I should be able to simply take a montane bowl, put in the oxytocin receptor in all the places where it is in the prairie bowl, and make my montane bowl behave like a prairie bowl. That would be the idea, and that's what Larry Young and Tom Insel and others did. So they essentially took the montane wool and stuck in the receptor genetically into the right circuit. So now you have a montane wool otherwise, but you've expressed the oxytocin receptor in the same circuits as it is in the prairie wool. And when you do that, okay, so this is the control. Here's where you can just get gene expression in the right circuit by driving it with this microsatellite. And when you do that, time in contact, you give you stimulate, here's a partner, here's a stranger, you get affiliative behavior. An affiliative behavior which a montane wool would never show otherwise. Okay? So two very similar genetic species with a minor difference in where the receptor was expressed changed the way this hormone was regulating social behavior. And you could replicate the experiment that nature did by simply sticking it in in the right places and then you get the behavior that the montane wool would show. All right. But the, perhaps the most dramatic thing would be to take a mouse, an experimental mouse, which is um, usually a C57 black 6 mouse. It's mass musculus. There are mice that are monogamous and pair bond. So this, this um, 
the mouse is not does not normally exhibit partner preference at least this mouse there are mice that do but this mouse species does so in this mouse species so here's a prairie vole here's a mouse here's the expression of the arginine vasopressin receptor it looks very different as you can see the prairie vole has it in many many circuits associated with reward it's not in those circuits you can take the transgene from the prairie vole using the microsatellite and make the mouse brain expression pattern look like that of the vole and when you do that you can make this is your mice normally they're like you know around about 50 percent is here so it's only a little over chance they don't really care about in the presence of arginine vasopressin they're not showing any partner preference you take one of these mutant mice that is now expressing the receptor in these circuits and lo and behold you can get affiliative behavior okay What, not a? Not a okay, so um, you know, let's put it this way. Think so. Okay, so here's where I'm going to think, going to argue with you from the point of view that our idea of thinking is language, our idea of thinking is the ability to produce poetry. But one form of thinking is the ability to climb up these walls and hide such that nobody catches you. And most of us, on those measures, will fail. It requires, no, it requires spatial intel intelligence. It requires you to remember all the possible hidden locations in all of Kitab Khana, right? And to be able to do this, I promise you, I'm no insult to the Kitab Khana, but there are mice somewhere here, okay? There are 100% mice somewhere here, and they probably have happily lived here without getting caught, and they've successfully produced many generations of their families and lived here without a problem. And to do that, that is a successful evolutionary experiment. Right? For them, they have successfully colonized this area. There, there are mice everywhere in Mumbai city. And yet we don't see them, we don't run across them every single day. Right? They somehow manage to do this and hide from what is a natural threat to them, which is us. That's not very different from thinking. We, it's true that we have a much larger prefrontal cortex, so we have the ability to control emotional responses in a way that is different from our other mammalian cousins. And so that is absolutely true. This massive expansion of cortex changed the way the cortex talks to what is considered the emotional brain, which are subcortical parts of the brain. So we have strong ability to say, shut it off. But along with a strong ability, we also got a whole bunch of strong biases as well. So. I'd hedge my bet on saying that we are absolutely that rational in being able to control our own emotional, natural instincts, okay? All right, so the bottom line is there are circuits in the brain that we know regulate emotion and regulate pair bonding. All right, I will skip this part and go to this. Okay, so is this at all relevant to us? You guys came in thinking she's going to tell me about, you know, morality, and now I'm not using the word at all, and which I'm not going to. I'm trying to do my level best not to use that word because it's a highly problematic word and has huge issues with how you can define it. It's highly contextual. It's completely dependent on environment, and it'll change from location and situation from one moment to another. So I'm going to leave it alone, okay? But I'm going to tell you about an experiment that people who've been doing neuroeconomics and economics have been doing. So let's say I have two people who have sort of seen each other but don't know each other. So they came in for the experiment, they saw each other, they knew there was an experiment. And what happens is subject one gets a certain amount of money, okay, X amount of money. Now this person has the ability, so that's my investor. My investor has the ability to give some amount of money to this subject, okay. And whatever money is given, I will triple. So if they give, give $6, I will make that $18, okay? Plus some amount of money is given to the two of them as well. Now that person, as soon as this money comes, has that plus whatever is tripled and can give back some money back here. And after they give it back, once again, there is the possibility to share in this dyad. And over a period of time, it's in their interest to continue to share money because the best thing that could happen is eventually they get a ton more money if they keep doing this appropriately. For which this person has to trust that person and this person has to exhibit some degree of trustworthiness by returning the money and not keeping it all, right? So this is a relationship that develops between two individuals who don't really know each other but know that they're human beings on either side. So they know they're dealing with a conspecific. So studies show that when you give oxytocin to this individual, the one who's giving the money, 
when you have relative to 20% of time getting the money, you get 40% of the time willing to share money. Okay, so your likelihood to trust um, and give money to a con specific increases after a nasal spray of oxytocin. Not very surprising, oxytocin has recruits many similar circuits in our brain as it does in our, in our rodent cousin's brains. Much the same way, okay, but that only works if it's a human being. So if I keep giving oxytocin puffs and I tell this person at the other end it's a computer who's just going to do whatever it does using a, you know, a random algorithm and send you back stuff, then it doesn't work. It requires this person to believe that if they're dealing with a member of their own species who may take the call to share some of that wealth and hopefully some of that wealth will come back. So this is, this is an interesting idea to think about. All right. Yes, so 95% of the time participant B also sends back the money, which means that they exhibit trustworthiness. They were trusted and they exhibited trustworthiness. It's very interesting to see which circuits in the brain get activated and people have started now doing MRI, fMRI imaging to look at that. But I want to make this thesis, which is a, not very surprising, everybody knows this. We are social creatures, okay? Trustworthiness is a value, yeah? Uh, lack of trustworthiness, so if we lose trustworthiness, we lose our reputation over a period of time. Reputation is an extremely important currency. It matters in our social interactions. Social isolation is a cost for social species. Exclusion is associated with distress, being abolished, being punished, being removed from a social group is a cost. And obviously, as a consequence, untrustworthiness starts becoming a cost over a period of time. Okay. So if we were to define things like empathy, then the essence of empathy is the ability to stand in another's shoes. Yeah? Um, so is it trustworthiness even in those, in those rats and those more so, that you talked about? So yes, because in a sense, there's a prediction being made about your conspecific behavior. Let's say I see this animal, I expect this animal to behave within a certain framework. Anything that is utterly unexpected of my prediction causes quite a bit of chaos and can result in social exclusion in those species as well. We are pattern completers and of, as a species. We predict behavior. Anyone that does something out of the box utterly and challenges that prediction is a source of discomfort for us. So we have certain degree of, and that's, it's interesting to think about when institutions we build institutions. Institutions presumably were built by human beings, but then they become institutions. And then when institutions fail to exhibit trustworthiness, collectively, what is the social cost when an institution fails to exhibit? It's, it's interesting to think about. There is a way that you measure the trust. Um, so in this experiment, you measure it by, you just have a measure of saying how much money did ca came back, that's all, right? right. So it's, it's a, in this, it's a very rudimentary uh, measure of trust. In experiments with wolves, you're measuring whether or not the animal behaved as would have been predicted by previous behavior, right? So it's trust in, a, in the narrowest sense of the definition, not in the fullest sense of its definition. Got it. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So are there circuits for empathy? All right. So now let's say if it matters, do we care about somebody we are attached to being in trouble? So let's look at this experiment. So this is again done in rodents. So it's done in voles. You have animals that have been hanging out with each other. Then this animal hangs around alone and one animal goes out and comes back. One animal goes out, gets a little bit of a foot shock and comes back. So it's a little unpleasant. It's a little bit stressed out. It comes back. What you see is the amount of time that they spend on allo grooming each other. They're social species, so they're constantly grooming each other. The grooming grows up dramatically when they go back with an animal that was separated and had a trauma event during the separation. Okay? So we do know that during trauma, there are ultrasonic distress calls because they're making a distress saying this is unpleasant. It's sending out a distress call. Presumably, those distress calls also continue during this period of time. Just to look at it, cumulative grooming, here's the baseline, they're grooming each other, you know, they, they're, they're grooming, but they're not really actively pair bonded yet. When they've been separated, but there's been no stress, you get some amount of grooming. But if an animal was separated and it came back after a stressful experience, then the animal that was hanging around and waiting for that animal to come will do all of this. Now, this becomes an interesting question. 
would we anthropomorphize and call this consolation? Or an attempt to say it's okay, you know? Clearly, there's allo-grooming. There's a strong amount of allo and we don't want to make that leap, but certainly in this species, as a consequence of separation and distress, you see a clear increase in behaviors that indicate grooming. Hmm? All right. And you need oxytocin for this behavior to happen because here's the increase in grooming. You block the oxytocin receptor and you go back to the baseline. You don't have this enhanced amount of grooming that is taking place. All right. And it matters who that animal is. Now, this is where we start getting into the tough stuff, right? So if it's your mate, prairie voles will allo-groom their mates that have gone through a separation trauma. So this is before the trauma, this is after, after the trauma, the animal that was your mate comes back, significant increase. Sibling, significant increase. Stranger, doesn't happen. How is this being processed, right? So clearly, prairie vole species are able to detect their kin. And so we now know a lot more about how they identify their kin. We identify them visually, and obviously we've grown up with our own kin. And so we are, we are a very visual species. These are a very olfactory species. Every single rodent has an odorant signature. So there's a unique odor type that an animal carries, and that odorant signature is recognized. And so you can recognize your absolute close ones, those that are a circle out, those that are a further circle out, and this starts becoming really, really interesting as to how do you get this. So there's a familiarity bias. So the, even in these species, the willingness to help is dependent on familiarity, and that will become important. But I don't want you to walk away thinking this is hardwired, because it's after not. A long, very long period, even after a very long period, they uh, recognize the order. Yes, they recognize the order. It's like we recognize a face, even after 30 years. So you saw somebody from school, you saw the face 30 years ago, you say, oh yeah, you look familiar, and then you figure it out, right? They recognize the order. Yeah? So they absolutely recognize the order. So it is, the, it is not only to do with the receptor, it has to do with something else more than the receptor, right? It is to do with the presence of the receptor being activated in a circuit that is recognizing this individual as a conspecific, yes. So it's the combination of an association and the presence of, yeah. Yeah, it's never just it's never just the oxytocin. Yeah, so that becomes interesting because you can start getting with the oxytocin a widening of this. So that that, that that idea is something that people are actively pursuing. So this is work from Peggy Mason. So the longest time as human beings, we thought that only we are willing to help others selflessly. Okay, and it's very fantastic how we think all these things. We probably committed more on our own conspecifics than any other species seems to have done to their own conspecifics, but anyway. Here, so this is work from Peggy Mason, and I'll let her words describe it to you, so it's best. Rats sometimes have a bad reputation, but it's one they probably don't deserve. After all, not only do they show empathy toward companions in distress, scientists have now discovered that they will also help strangers. What we did was we took one rat who was always the free rat and then we had a stable of strangers. So on each day, and we do 12 days of testing, each day the free rat saw a different trapped rat. And what we saw was that they opened for strangers just like they were cage mates. However, when these rats were tested with rats from another strain, in this case a black caped variety, they would not help the stranger in distress. That led us to think that there might be some kind of social bias where rats will only help rats who are similar to them. And to test this question, we paired two rats of different types and housed them together. And we found that once they were housed together, those rats were willing to do anything for each other. So they were willing to help each other even though they weren't similar to each other. To figure out whether helping behavior required familiarity with an individual or with a strain, the researchers housed albino rats with black caped ones for two weeks. The albino rat was then rehoused with another albino rat before testing. They still remember living with these, this one, one individual black caped rat, and consequently they ended up opening for the black caped strangers. What that says is that the albino rat needs to know one individual of that type in order to extend a very pro-social feeling towards others that look like or smell like or feel like that 
that individual. So in other words, a diverse social environment made them act in, in a helpful manner towards others who are very different from themselves. But what happens if, if, what happens if they never meet themselves? What happens if they never have been exposed to another individual like themselves? So we sort of did a jungle book type experiment where we took the albino rats and we raised them from the day of birth in Long Evans litters. So they grew up in a world where they had no exposure to their own kind. We found that rats who were raised in a different world than their own were not interested in helping rats of their own kind as adults. And this was a powerful demonstration that social experience was the only variable that was determining who rats choose to help and who they choose not to help. Familiarity with the type of rat is clearly needed. And if they are not familiar with the type of rat, uh, they don't help. And that includes even their own type. And so they won't help. If they were raised in a different strain environment, they will not help strangers of their own strain. But once they've met even just one individual of a different strain, they will extend helping towards others of that strain. And that's a really powerful message that it really only takes one individual, a connection between one individual and another individual to open up a world, to open up a whole group to that individual. powerful work from Peggy Mason's lab at University of Chicago and why this is really interesting is now they're nailing down the circuitry in the brain that's actually responsible for this sort of helping behavior to a conspecific, someone of your own species of different strains and already you can see none of the stuff is hardwired. It's, there's a circuitry but who you've met changes where you will employ that circuitry. So that tells you that that circuit is so prone to being influenced by your life experiences if you're a rodent, right? The circuit that influences this is the anterior cingulate and an area called the insula. These two circuits exploded in primate evolution and we have huge anterior cingulate cortex and a very large insula. So in a sense, one would imagine that for us, there's a massive social value from actually widening our social networks and the process of doing this, but there's also equal likelihood that we are going to treat threats in a very interesting fashion. And that's interesting to me. We don't have data from humans. We only have imaging data. So we, you show an image, you show a, a perception of threat, there's imaging data. You don't have these kind of detailed experiments in humans. Okay. But prior experience and exposure matter. So the tendency that we think about genes making brain circuits, brain circuits producing behavior, you should say yes, genes produce brain circuits, brain circuits talk to environment, environment shapes brain circuits and changes the spectrum of behaviors you get. And that's where your entire universe of what you're exposed to dramatically educates the brain in terms of changing what behavioral output possibilities exist. Yeah? So behavior can only be examined keeping context in mind. It's contextual, contextual, contextual. So there's never one, only one end point. The spectrum of possibilities is high for rodents. You can imagine the spectrum of possibilities for primates and us. Yeah? So could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? And this is where the idea of a tapestry became interesting. Is there a place for widening the worldview in those very critical periods of early life, of childhood and adolescence for children. What, yeah? Uh, was this trait found to be heritable in case of mice since the experiments were 14? Okay. I'm sure that you've done the... Um, so people have done some of these experiments for inheritance. They've looked at it with uh, the level of quality of care that is exhibited, perhaps not in the exact same experiment, but I can extrapolate from another experiment. And in that, the quality of care you receive will directly program the quality of care you give. It's not genetically in 
So you can go with one cross in adoption and clear and erase that. And so that is very, very powerful demonstration of what's called a non-genomic inheritance. So you get it, but it's, it's programmed. And it's programmed by environment talking to those circuits and educating those circuits. So yes, there is a big effect of environment as well. Um, so perhaps the most dramatic example of these are strains of mice, C57s and Balpsies. C57s tend to be relatively risk takers in that they'll explore environment. Balpsies tend to be slightly more anxious and withdrawn. If you take Balpsy babies and adopt them to C57 mothers, they go halfway up. You take C57 babies, adopt them to Balpsy mothers, they go halfway down. That already tells you that genetically distinct inbred strains have that much pliability that they can move this much. So that tells you environment has a profound influence. Something that has been relatively ignored in comparison to the gene behavior approach, which is far more deterministic, this is one that gives you a very wide range of possibilities. And the data is so strong now, there's no argument against it, that even very inbred, genetically similar environment can change the range of outcomes dramatically. Yeah? Uh, that, yeah. Can you just uh, repeat that word? What is that kind of inheritance called? It's it called um, non-genomic. Non-genomic. Non another way of thinking about it is it's yeah, epigenetic. Yeah in that the environment talks to the genome, changes signatures near the DNA and changes expression of protein. So it's not because your gene sequence is different, but it's what you do with that gene, which is directly responsive to environment, yeah? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So we live in groups. Group dynamics, two to 200 members, foods, mates, predator, shelter, offspring, survival, reproduction, so many, all our behaviors are social and socially influenced, okay? and. Clearly, there's a bunch of interesting behaviors that support group harmony and imitation is something that we, we are incredibly good at as primates, okay? Um, very nice experiments done where people have done an assessment of trustworthiness between the person who's interviewing and the interviewee. So let's say you come in for an interview, I'm the interviewer. I watch your behavior and I gradually imitate you. I don't do it in a very horrible way, an obvious way, which looks like I'm mocking you. But you just changed your, I change and I imitate, I, I change my tone of voice, I change the way I'm talking to you and in that your assessment of my trustworthiness or likability is directly influenced, okay? So it's interesting, obviously marketing people love this. So yeah, you can imagine what you can do with this. It can go a little bit insane. But we do a ton of mimicking, right? Accent, speech rate, speech rhythms, facial expressions, moods, posture, mannerisms, idiosyncratic mood. And if we are using this imitation to define what we consider familiar versus what we consider not so familiar, you can start beginning to see where these so many complex inputs in the case of, of, of our species. Yeah. So the, the interesting book called The Unbearable Automaticity of Being, which is how much of your reactions are just automatic without your even realizing them, rapid quick judgment calls that we take, which we don't even realize. Explicit biases we will call out, right? We hopefully will call out. Now, I don't even think we're really calling those out. So let's be careful about that. But explicit biases, there's at least the possibility of calling out. But with an implicit bias, we don't even know it exists. And you could say, I'm the most egalitarian, free thinking, liberal, open-minded person, and you can have a ton of implicit biases. So I'm going to make a suggestion to you all at the end of it that there's these very nice tests called the implicit assessment test. It's the IAT. Harvard administers it. It's online. Go do it. It's a lot of fun to discover your own implicit biases. It's amazing what you think about yourself and what your data will suddenly show you because when the data is there, you're thinking, oh, I thought I was, I had no such bias. And then suddenly the data comes back and you realize that your own perception of how open-minded you were on multiple things is actually a bit shaky. I just did one this morning. It was quite interesting, suffice it to say. Yeah, so yeah. It's interesting how it challenges, but the, the implicit biases are truly frightening because we have no, no idea. You can think explicitly that oh, I have, know that I'm this sort of a liberal, open-minded person, but then you realize, actually, no, we have a ton of implicit biases. We're just unaware of them, okay? And that's only when we're put under, this test is done under super speed. So you have to give rapid, quick responses. And when you're under stress and under pressure, all your implicit biases come straight up to the surface, right? You don't have time to suppress them. So anyway, yeah? All right. 
So let's look at this. Let's solve this, okay? The fa a father and a son are out driving. They're involved in an accident. The father is killed and the son is critical in critical condition. The son is rushed to the hospital and prepared for the operation. The doctor comes in, sees the patient and exclaims, I can't operate, it's my son. How can this be? Very. You will be surprised how many people get that wrong. Yeah? It is amazing how many people get that one wrong or struggle to give you a quick response and have to spend some time thinking what the answer is. Uh, okay, but that's not possible. He was in the accident. Then you realize there's another parent in the mix. And it's, it's interesting. This has been done in large numbers, lots of people looking at the speed of response. It's the speed. It's how quickly does that thought come to you. You'll eventually solve it. It's not a complicated riddle. But how quickly do you get, is it, is it even a riddle? Should it even be a riddle? But it is because we have a preconceived notion of who the doctor would have been. Would have been the father. So, you know, there is a preconceived notion. Anyway, these are the circuits in humans. The amygdala for threat perception, the insula for subjective emotion. This is the circuitry that influences eventually the behavior. And I will just go quickly through this. Yeah, yeah. Here's the data, by the way. 35% of over 200 subjects answered the riddle correctly. So it is important, it's interesting to think about that how we, so it's only 35%. And if everyone was truthful to the bone in this room, there will be some people say, oh crap, I was actually trying to solve that riddle. But I saw some people say, mother, but it, it, it's possible. And if you've done it, it isn't an, in, it's not an indictment on you. It's just what we've been socialized with. It's what our our society has done in terms of training our brain. We are, it's a very nice brain. It gets trained very nicely. Yeah, very society. quickly. So yeah. Can you go back to the yeah. Side yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just the circuitry in the in the human brain that's associated with this. We don't have the nail down details of the molecules. Don't know the receptors. We know it's likely to be similar given the circuits reutilize the same modules over and over again. But let me continue and come to this. I want to tell you all about this experiment because this to me is the most traumatic experiment of an implicit bias that I've ever seen. Okay? So you can, um, if you watch somebody getting touched here versus somebody being impaled with a needle here, if I show you somebody with a needle being impaled, your muscle here will undergo and give you a mean evoked potential because you're going to flinch. It's the reaction you'd have if somebody else's was, you know, somebody was being having a nail driven through their hand, you'd flinch because there's this oops response, okay? And you can actually measure an evoked potential here. So they did this experiment and then you can do it with the control area and the other, other side, etc. We leave this. The bottom line of the data is it depends on the species <laughs> In color, right? So it's, if it's a monkey hand, you may not respond the same way. It's just color. So if you do this with white subjects, and, and now you could take the most liberal person saying, I have no such stereotype, but when you're recording their mean evoked potential, you get a response to a white hand. You fail to get a response to a black hand, but you do get a response to a purple hand, which means even an alien hand will get a response, but you will actively suppress your reaction for that of a race that you consider as a potential threat. Yes. Where, did you, where was the experiment done? This is done in the US. So they didn't do it in more mixed race populations like Trinidad? As a member. Yeah. No. No, because this is highly contextual again. Absolutely, because based on, on where you do this, this will vary. But this, because this is a learned behavior. These are learned conditionings, right? These are not instinctive responses that you would expect to get at the absolute starting scale. These are learned conditionings that the nervous system learns, actively learns from what, how it's being socialized, right? So kind of a racist, uh... Well, it's, it's uh, not explicit. Yeah. No, the person could say, I am, yeah, but no, but it's an implicit bias that's being picked up through things like this, right? So the fact that you can pick up implicit biases of this kind is truly frightening because this, I mean, it's, it's the, the data tells us that there's, we are at the tip of the iceberg of implicit biases. We really have a, because we are so socialized as a nervous system, that our nervous system has been conditioned by what we've been, had jammed into us, and an outgroup is a threat to us. 
many ways. Yeah. 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 So it varies. There's a huge amount of variation from individual to individual. But cumulatively, when you have a large percentage of data, you start seeing this phenotype, which indicates that obviously in every single individual, you will not get this. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you take a bunch of black individuals, again, this is US. That's a context. That's why her point is valid. You do this experiment in some other country, that it'll change. It'll change depending on what is the big bias in that lo localized environment. That is the big bias in the US that got picked up with this. But there'll be biases like that in India, which you will pick up will be something else that will come up, right? So each society, depending on its predominant sense of, uh, of biases. Yeah, Vijay. Uh, could there be an evolutionary advantage for having such Threat perception, there's a massive evolutionary advantage. Anything that you viewed as an outgroup that could potentially threaten your con specifics, you needed to protect against. So yes, there is an evolutionary advantage of protecting against. But in complex environments where there are multiple social interactions, that can get hijacked to get convert in, converted into something like this. But yes, there is an evolutionary advantage from the perspective of having a circuitry for threat perception. It's just getting hijacked by bias. That's all, right? So yeah. Was this done with a particular age group? Yes, adults. Yes, so adults. Is that to say that children might not? Yes, it is likely to say that children, depending on what happens to them in that period of time, may not exhibit that behavior. Yes. Yeah. Again, this goes back to the context. So if you do the Stroop right? test with uh, very young children who have not yet learned to read but no color, they will not have that timing problem. Okay. Yeah. If you take the Stroop test and you do it with somebody who doesn't, uh, who speaks Marathi, hasn't learned the English alphabet, but knows the colors at least, will go through it very quickly, but without a problem of conflict. The conflict comes when you have something else overriding another response, and your brain now is processing contradictory responses. So yes. So yes, absolutely, it's very, very contextual. Yeah. But it might be just very interesting to see where um, a dark skin populace has been uh, conditioned to think of the white man as of a superior race. So what happens in such a situation? The reverse way around, which is you could also do it the reverse way around and say that you will now have, uh, you know, if you were to reverse that scenario, that's something that has been done in classrooms as an attempt to see what it would be like to be at the receiving end of that bias. Very interesting experiments that teachers have done with young kids to teach them the idea of what happens when you're stuck in an out group and you're being actively discriminated. I'll show you that video. It's, it's, an, it's an Oprah Winfrey show. So I have an Oprah Winfrey show video. That's like, <laughs> you know, what else to do? I, I, but but this, this is interesting. There is a possibility to rewrite the boundaries of the in-group and the out-group. Clearly, there's a possibility in rodents. You saw the possibility in rats. You simply had to raise a Long Evans rat and a Sprague Dolly rat with one such other from another strain and instantaneously you got helping behavior to any other Long Evans animal. So if it's as dramatic as that in rodents, there's plenty of data in humans coming from sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, a variety of studies that indicate the way you were socialized, what you were exposed to, the, your expanse of your worldview. And that's where art comes into the picture, because your worldview dramatically explodes the minute you have art, literature, poetry, you know, things that can activate those same empathy circuits without necessarily bringing every human being of every type in front of you, because that's not going to be possible, right? But you can experience what they experience through the visual world, through the written word, etc., right? Okay, so let's come to this quickly. But I just want to put this up, because when we talk about what species can do to each other, we did do this to each other, and we have continued to do this over and over again, right? So we, this is frightening. Uh, yeah. So how do we do this? What's, so this is one of the hardest things for us to figure out. We don't know in, in humans what all allows the social categorization to happen, and when do we start categorizing? How early does this actually start? Us, them, this me, mine, out, not mine, not like me, something that's different. You know, when does that actually start? That becomes a really interesting question, right? So in-group, out-group, and in-group bias, right? When do you start getting these kinds of biases? We don't really understand for the human condition at all. 
and it's something that we really should be thinking about. Okay, so let's watch this Oprah Winfrey video. Today's audience was separated into two groups, not on the color of their skin where they separated when they arrive. They were separated based on the color of their eyes, but they have no idea that they were separated. What we did was treat each group differently, discriminating against the people who have blue eyes, catering to those people with brown eyes. Come on, come on, come on, come on. What color your eyes? Blue. Over there, put it on. No, no, no. Over there. Blue. Over there. The blue-eyed people were pulled out of line, told to put on a green collar and wait outside. When the brown-eyed people arrived, they were told to step to the front of the line. Audience members with brown eyes were allowed to enjoy coffee and donuts. The blue-eyed group became upset when they saw the brown-eyed people were being seated first. Diversity expert Jane Elliott helped set up the experiment. I've been a teacher for 25 years in the public, private, and parochial schools in this country, and I have seen what brown-eyed people have done as compared to what blue-eyed people do. And it's perfectly obvious. And if I didn't believe it before this morning, you should have been here this morning when we brought these people in here. Feeling discriminated against, the blue-eyed audience members were visibly upset. She was rude to us, rude. all of us. Yelled at us, called us names, pushed us aside. She was rude. This one is say, why doesn't Jane have a green collar on? She wants She's to got say blue eyes. Because I've learned to act brown-eyed. I have a brown-eyed husband and three brown-eyed children. Why did you? And the message in this room is, act brown-eyed and you too can take off your collar. Act intelligently oh, and you too won't on. lose your collar. That's, None of you have, have acted intelligently yet. It wasn't long before the brown-eyed people bought into the idea that they were superior. You people. in school who was blue-eyed. She was so stupid. She was always copying off of my papers. These people were so rude and so noisy today, we couldn't hear any ourselves even talk. It was ridiculous. Eventually, the audience figured out the show was really about race. Now, he was so angry, he took off his collar way on early. How many of you people of color can take off the collar that we have put on you? How many of you can take off your color? But if a black male refuse to follow your orders or your husband's orders or your father's orders on the street, you would not see that as being highly principled. You would see him as being an uppity nigger. Well, we can see where this is going. She's saying that everybody has racism in them. It's not really about the eye. She's trying to teach about racism. But she can't get away from the fact that God created the races and you are going to be different. You can't help it. God to be like that. One race, the human race, and human beings created racism. We caught up with the mastermind behind the eye color test. Jane Elliott is her name, 22 years later. I loved teaching. I started the blue eyed, brown eyed exercise because Martin Luther King Jr. had been one of our heroes of the month in February in my third grade classroom, and he was dead at the hands of an assassin. I hate to talk about this because every time I talk about it, I remember how it felt that day. I was going to have to go into my classroom and explain to my students why the adults in this country had allowed somebody to kill hope, because Martin Luther King, for me, was hope for this country. I decided that the next day I was going to do what Hitler did. I was going to pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they had no control, separate them according to the color of their eyes, treat one group badly and treat the other group very well and see what would happen. Eye color and skin color are caused by the same chemical, melanin. There is no logic in judging people by the amount of a chemical in their skin. Pigmentation should have nothing to do with how you treat another person but unfortunately it does. Give me a child at the age of eight, let me do that exercise, and that child is changed forever. This was really interesting from the perspective that, look at what we've done. This is genocide, human genocide across the years, and this is only the big numbers, okay? We don't have to look very far. We've genocide in our own corners, in our own country, yeah? And it's horrifying. 
and we do this over and over and over again and if you know yes absolutely right so you don't have to look very far we do this as a species over and over again but I didn't want to end on that note so I'm going to end here and say this right I mean it's it's phenomenal if you can also have this so this is human possibility that is also human possibility we started with talking about rodents and saying behavioral outcomes are this much think about our nervous system and the behavioral outcome possibilities just keep going more and more and more and so then there's an even greater role for what we do within those first two decades of life with kids and if we do it right then we have some scope <laughs> and some chance otherwise uh, we'll be an evolutionary experiment that doesn't last and evolution will continue anyway so you know it'll be just a blip and that's that's it thank you for giving me this opportunity Absolutely, happy to. Sorry, my question to you is, uh, as you mentioned the rats that live in colonies and all that, and you said that they have a special order to mark their siblings or somebody, right? Yeah. So uh, how about, I have this set of uh, rats that live in a colony, and a stranger rat comes in, how will they react to him or that so rat? So it depends so on how, how similar the odor type is. Now this is interesting, people have done experiments um, to see how mate choice also takes place with reference to this, right? So obviously, you, uh, so there's mate preference that the rats show when you have other animals that come in. And it turns out that you actually would, uh, from the evolutionary standpoint, the idea of having a mate that is actually genetically different is an evolutionary advantage rather than one that's very close only because there's an increased survival fitness that happens with that. And that's just a general theory that exists. So it turns out that you, you do detect, if it's, if it's a conspecific that's a female and it's a male rat, then usually the male, depending on whether this is a female, will usually put the moves on the female. That's the standard behavior for a rat. If it's a male and another male comes in, then it will fight with the male and protect its territory. But it depends on whether it perceives it as a threat or not. So that's usually what happens. But very quickly, when they are in a tribe together, they develop a dominance hierarchy very, very fast. So even in a, in a laboratory situation where you have animals in a laboratory cage, there's a very quick breaking down of who's going to get access to food first, who's going to get access to water first. There's a breakdown of that. And that is in the males, at least in rodents, it tends to be simply based on, on, on the physical fighting. But it gets much more complex in primates. In primates, dynasty starts mattering. Who you came from matters, who your mother was matters, because there's a much more, yeah, there's a much deeper understanding of relationships. You know, this one is related to this one, this one is that one's cousin, we never think about it, but they know. So baboons, macaques, rhesus, gibbons, bonobos, no relationship. So they know how they're related. And so relationships start determining, also start determining where you sit on dominance hierarchies. Yeah. Uh, question related to yeah. what he asked. Mm -hmm. So is that, excuse me, please, if you don't mind. Sorry. Sure. So does it, uh, does the response, so again, now I'm so happy to see that we have moved beyond the fight and flight which we thought animals and rodents and all, they just kind of operate from there. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, does this response um, or we the perception... We also operate in the fight and flight. Today, yeah, we do. We do extremely we do. well there. So we yeah, also yeah, have yeah, the circuit exists for us. Right, but so I, I thought we were a little better than that, but I realized that no, we're not. <laughs> we, we have a very large cortex that's allowing us to yeah. contextualize whether... So for example, I see a plastic snake. Okay, I don't know it's a plastic snake, it's slightly dark, I see a snake, I'm going to get a fight and flight right. response because usually a flight response, most cases, if it's mm. a snake, I will run away, right? The very quick response. But the minute I see it's a plastic snake, this is the wrong location, how can a snake be in the middle of Kitab Khan? All of these other, Absolutely. you know that this is just, it's just a trick or it's something else that's happened. You need to actually shut off these responses. Right. Otherwise, these responses are primed to go. And they need to go because you can't take too long to think about think, them. You yeah, need to yeah, escape. Yeah, I agree. So that's very conserved. Yeah. But my question was that uh, when a rodent perceives a threat from another species, 
does that does anything um like so his own ability to handle the threat does that come in the picture like a stronger rodent would not perceive it as a threat as much as a weaker rodent huh. or a malnourished rodent or something mm. like that that tough does question that tough question to answer but i'll tell you how people have done it uh, the closest approximation so forget about some other threat because if it's a cat all rodents sensible rodents will run away right so so but rodent to rodent it's very interesting let's say you do a tube test you have a tube like this and so this is actually a test that people do to determine how, who's higher in the social dominance hierarchy so a tube like this and there's usually a reward at the center and both animals are put in from either side they see each other the one that is subordinate will secede and let the dominant take the space okay if there's even if even if there isn't any food in general rodents like to burrow so they like narrow spaces they like tunnels the right of that tunnel goes to the the dominant in many cases that happens to be the one that's physically stronger but that's not always the case primates this falls out of the window because what you can get is an extremely large alpha we can taken on by a beta and a, and a delta because alliances can form in primates which do not form as actively in rodents so two two slightly strong can take on one big and take it out so alliance building has become a huge thing in primate societies which is natural because you can now build an alliance and then cooperate to actually dispose of yeah so so that happens much more in primates doesn't happen in rodent species thank you Tell us more about your morality connection with all oh, this. Oh yeah, I can't because I don't. I I don't work on morality, so I I can't for the following reason that I think that eventually there are a lot of people who've had a philosophical point of view on morality. Many many philosophers have. Patricia Churchlin. I would, if you want to read about it, I'd really recommend this book because she writes beautifully about it. And if I tell you, I'll be a very poor proxy. because i don't work on this so i will only tell you what i have read and so that then you'll get my interpretation in it rather than the real stuff straight from where it is so read read her she's actually quite interesting there's a there's an interesting perspective i think neuroscience is just one of the things that comes to the table when you talk about morality there's going to be a huge element of of socialization sociology anthropology culture the nervous system is influenced by all of that eventually that results in in what we call moral values you discussed the you talked about the biological basis of empathy uh what happens to this in the case of sibling rivalries within families how does this get impact yeah so i mean empathy is always all so going to be contextual right and so depending on i mean you children do also undergo that kind of competition for attention then it will be either from the parents or within the environment for resources usually that's negotiated and that's actually the early training of cooperation that is the early playing ground where a lot of relationships are being used by children to suss out what their broader world will be but you can also have that go completely awry much the same way as empathy empathetic behavior often goes awry for all of us so as we can shut off we selectively exhibit so there's an interesting experiment that somebody did on youtube where um they took a child who was well dressed well attired and sent her wandering around in uh, on a street and the number of people who stopped and spoke to that child and asked and then they took the same child and just made her look completely unkempt like a child that lives on the street nobody stopped and we do it every day in bombay right we do it without it's just because us our, our circuits in a sense start saying we can't do anything about this i'm not going to look at this so that that seems to be a, an ability we also have which is the ability to shut down that because we are not able to put it to quote unquote use or it's not being recruited or we were socialized with exactly that approach that's what we watch we imitate it so i would say that circuits like that there is every possible output of behavior is possible you don't have to have only one outcome so you can have extremely negative and extremely positive and every variant of shade in between uh very insightful uh, session professor uh, one clarification i need uh, you said you would resist doing any extrapolation on that why why what is that why am i re resisting to do an extrapolation because um 
that's uh, something that as a scientific community we've got to guard against. It's been done a little too often and too quickly and the, mi the minute we study diverse species we already see that between voles and rats there are dramatic differences and they're both rodents. Okay, so already you can see for example the voles will not as easily help a stranger, rats will help a stranger as long as they had seen a stranger like that. Two species, very different kinds you know, of behaviors but within the same broad genus and family. If that much variation can exist within mammals of the rodent class, for me to extrapolate data from the voles straight to the humans where we don't know the circuitry yet even though we know the building blocks are likely to be the same is super dangerous and I think it's worrisome to do that. An alternative way to think about it is to simply say, hey, this is interesting, can I take some insights from this that might be relevant to apply rather than to say that what happens here is necessarily what happens there. So I would guard against that. That's a risky, that's a slippery slope. You can make a conjecture because it is X, so it will be Y and that will be wrong. And we don't have the data, so we have no data yet to support. Hi, thank you very much for a wonderful session and uh, my question is on the dopamine effect on addiction behavior which is what why I'm here for because I deal with addictions. Okay, so that's another circuitry that's beautifully designed to get hijacked. Like our circuits of empathy or threat perception can get hijacked by bias, our reward pathways are extremely strongly laid down again evolutionarily strongly conserved across vertebrate evolution. It's a uh, dopaminergic pathway that goes from the midbrain to a structure called the nucleus accumbens. It's a circuit that's ideally present to be hijacked by drugs of abuse, can be hijacked by cocaine, heroin, amphetamines, nicotine, the works, okay. So the, so the thing with that is that the, so the problem with that is that in that case, that circuit also produces endorphins to natural rewards, which include social interactions, which includes food, which includes sex, what one considers the naturally existent rewards. But the level of dopamine that's produced or endorphin release in that circuit with natural rewards is here. The extent produced with drugs of abuse is fold, several fold higher. The problem that happens is you now, if you if there's a state of addiction, you set your threshold here and then natural reward cease to be rewarding. Which is why you often see a breakdown of social, social support structures, you see a loss of interest in natural rewards and that happens in rodent models and of course by that one has also seen that in humans. So it's a, it happens in rodents, absolutely. So you'll see animals choosing to continuously self-administer cocaine and give up food. You'll see that. So it is a circuit that is beautifully laid out for natural rewards, but it's also a circuit that is directly available for getting hijacked. And it does get hijacked. So many, many drugs of abuse, nicotine will hijack it, alcohol will hijack it. So the rewarding level with My voice is loud. <laughs> okay, and uh, mostly with the increasing social uh, relationships widening, mm -hmm. as you call it the okay. mm -hmm. I'm calling it the relationship as a okay today. Hmm. You're saying, uh, so, so social interactions provide, well, social interactions certainly provide us a dopamine burst that they do. They do, but the level is never in the zone where you, where, which you get with some of the, the drugs. The levels are never there. Um, of course, there's a debate about whether this becomes addictive. In a sense, does, does the idea of social networking or expanding these, is it, there is a possibility, but it's not on the scale like the, the drugs of abuse. Now, the drugs of abuse are really off the charts. Is there an unfold. experiment that's being done with the social media and these chemicals? Like Hmm, good question. I don't know if people have sat and measured um, like release of endor yeah, endogenous endorphin. orphan. Yeah, like I don't I, I don't know. I should look. I have I don't know. Maybe somebody has done it. It's an interesting question. I don't know. I don't know if somebody's actually done that. They might have. I don't know. I don't know that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is that by meditation and yoga, is it that the circuitry changes? Mm -hmm. And the second one is that I understand that 
our genetics is almost 99.9% similar to our cousins. Mm -hmm. So why has this evolution been so different for us? Okay. So uh, I'll do the first one. Um, so we've got um, uh, oxygen sensing, pH sensing neurons in our brainstem and uh, modulation of the amount of oxygen you get or your pH levels in those neurons directly changes brainwave activity. This it does in rodents, you can simply change the amount of oxygenation in the brain and change the activity. You can also, people have done this also in individuals who've been meditating and then they've done either electrocorticograms or EEGs and um, there's a particular kind of rhythm called a gamma rhythm that is associated with a highly attentive state where you're uh, focusing on a task. Individuals who've had substantial practice, so you need a substantial amount of practice, can go into a gamma rhythm by themselves by just doing a meditative practice. So yes, there's clearly the ability to influence brain activity. Whether it influences circuits is a separate level of question, which is to ask, can it now change the way those circuits are wired? I don't know, because that's a difficult experiment to address. Um, in the detail, I would be, I, it's unlikely it'll change it in the, in the large extent of connectivity. I would be surprised if it doesn't change it in the detail, because many experiences can have a enriched environment. The quality of environment has a profound effect in rodents on changing architecture locally within circuits, not at a global level, but locally. I'd be surprised if it doesn't. I would be very surprised because it is a strong training practice that individuals have to go through. And that kind of breath control and training, I'd be surprised if it did not have an effect. I would, I would, I would expect it to have an effect. It certainly has a strong behavioral effect. It has an effect on, on brain network activity. Oh, the second question. The second question, so in terms of our genes, we're very, very similar. But you know, our genes are only a very small percentage of our entire genome. We have a ton of other DNA in there that doesn't make any protein, so it is not called a gene. In the past, we used to call it junk DNA because we didn't know what it did. Okay, the general view is we, so our junk DNA has expanded hugely out of proportion. Turns out it's not junk DNA. Now we know that it's clearly not junk DNA. We know that that DNA influences the way genes will express themselves. And by changing that, even though you can have similar sequences, just like with the microsatellite you saw, that's, a, a, that's not a gene, it's a region ahead of the gene. Just by changing that sequence, you change where this protein is expressed in the brain. Sequence is not actually that dramatically different. So if you had asked me the question about two voles and said, are the receptors similar? I would have said they're close to identical. They just end up in different places and they end up in different places because the gene is not changed, but the genome next to it that controls where those genes will be expressed is dramatically different. And so in us, compared to our primate cousins, we have this expansion of the genome in terms of a lot of regulatory elements that have come in. We're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding it because till just 10 years ago, we would have called all that junk DNA and said we don't know what it does. But it clearly is doing a lot. As he brought up yog, and I think it's very important. Uh, we have five major prans within us mm -hmm. and five other prans, mm -hmm. that means ten. Mm -hmm. Now with certain kriyas, it can alter the circuit. So, uh, because these kriyas are very powerful, so, uh, if, you're, if you do it regularly. So in, in terms of what you and I might be defining as circuit, maybe we're differing in what we define as circuit. I am saying like let's say area A is connected to area B in the brain. It's unlikely in my opinion that any experiential practice will change whether A is connected to B. What it may change is how much A influences B or is influenced back. That is in the detail. So the connectivity of the brain usually doesn't change globally. What changes is how parts of brain regions talk to each other. That I can believe many practices can change. I would find it surprising if it didn't because, because experience is directly constantly talking to the brain to rewire those circuits. So that you need, that's how you learn. If you didn't have this, you couldn't learn like how to go from here to church gate station. Because the first time you won't know and then every 20 times later you will now know it without even thinking about it because those circuits are being consolidated, strengthened, memories are being you know, put in. So circuits are constantly plastic to allow that kind of change to happen. Yeah. I entered when that Anne Frank quotation was <laughs> that one can start doing good right. anytime yeah. one. And my only query is, is 
you were I heard about protection and behavioral analysis. Mm -hmm. My only question is for adults, any person above 70, the Parkinson, Alzheimer, and all, the doctors, they just say it is age-related diseases. One forgets, one feels threatened. Yeah. So could you just throw uh, protection, could you just throw some light upon this? Sure. Because unfortunately, my mother, who is 80 plus, uh, very, when young, very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Now she has somebody stealing her ornament, somebody yeah. is behind the curtain attacking her. So could you just yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn how many things we are not able to really solve and repair. And in many cases, neurological diseases, all the treatments that are available are only palliative. So we can reduce the worsening of the symptoms. We don't treat the primary disease at all. We just can handle some of those symptoms. And what seems to happen, at least with disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's is very different, but with Alzheimer's is that often the ability of cortical circuits to talk to those very subcortical circuits that result in perception of stress, perception of a threat, perception of somebody doing you damage. That is a circuit that is inherently can get activated and has to be shut down. The circuits that talk to those circuits and shut them down are the places where all of the cells start dying associated with Alzheimer's. And that can also happen with senile dementia as well. It doesn't only happen with Alzheimer's. But when that happens, you see a spectrum of behaviors emerge that otherwise normally we are able to tamp down upon. And, uh, you know, I would say that people have used things like music. People have used other ways via which to a distraction seems to be the most effective way with the nervous system. It seems to be the only way, given that there aren't any really curative approaches at the moment in time. Professor, thank you so much for coming to this moment.